Hello, everyone. Welcome to Learning Data Live 2019. I'm Alan Pringle of Scriptorium, and I am moderating the first two sessions today. This session is Data versus CMS by Ulrika Parson, the founder of Parson AG. Learning Data Live is brought to you by Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped companies manage, structure, organize, and distribute content in an efficient way. If you were trying to figure out how the DITA model can best support your content, or you were setting up a new DITA tool system, please contact us. We would love to work with you. LearningDita.com and Learning Data Live would not be possible without the help from our sponsors. We would also like to thank Parson AG for creating the site, LearningDita.de. I want to tell you a little bit about how this webcast is going to work. Attendees are muted during the webcast. Even so, we still want your input during the session. Please type your questions and your comments at any time in the questions module, and our speaker will answer those questions at the end of the session. So if you would, take a little time now to locate the questions module in the GoToWebinar interface. At the beginning of the question and answer phase, please look for a link to a session evaluation survey. We very much appreciate your feedback on these sessions. And with that, I am going to hand things over to Ulrika. Ulrika, are you there? I'm there. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, do you see my screen? We sure do. It looks great. So just, okay, yeah, good morning to you. It's um, 4 p.m. where I live, and uh, thank you for the introduction by Scriptorium. Uh, my name is Ulrike uh, Parson, and I'm the founder of uh, a company named Parson. We are located in Germany, uh, in Hamburg and Berlin. That's our main offices. And we are technical communication consultants, meaning that we do write a lot of technical documentation. And just like Scriptorium, we help clients to switch to XML-based authoring and publishing and to content delivery portals or component content management systems. Okay, the question today is whether there is a question like, uh, do you choose DITA or a CCMS, whether that really is a de decision that you need to make. Uh, I put that question uh, because in Europe and especially in Germany, you have a strong position of all the component content management systems that are not based on data but use their own uh, structure and document definition. So um, mostly a decision for CCMS is also a decision against data in Germany. But I think that the question whether you work with data or CCMS is actually like comparing apples and oranges or as we Germans would put it, comparing apples and pears. Um, because if you think of data as the apple, that's a nice food that you can chew. It's a, it's a format, a semantic information architecture that you can use to write your content in. And the orange is a complete system where you have additional functions like workflow, translation management, terminology checking, authoring memory, you name it. Everything you need in addition to your document type definition. So there is no decision for or against a CCMS or DITA. It's just different things that you need to decide uh, along your way. And that's exactly what I want to talk about, the way 
of how to get from structured content, uh, from unstructured content to structured content and a modern way of authoring technical information. And I want to present you a, an approach, a structured approach for, for doing so, which is based on defining your requirements, uh, evaluating system and then implementing the solution. That's why I depicted that as a way, because that is a way that you need to go when you want to go to structured authoring. There are a lot of challenging challenges that we face today. Um, we are in the age of digitization. Everybody talks about information 4.0, industry 4.0, the smart factories, the connected industry, and uh, chatbots and AI. Um, but what I see at the conferences and when I go to the um, regional meetings of technical writers is that a lot of them are still caught in unstructured content. They're still working with InDesign, with Word. Um, some of them in the software industry are working with Markdown languages. Uh, so they actually have to fight and deal with unstructured content and a very limited technical infrastructure. That also implies that um, they have an insufficient management of variants. On the one hand, and with all the customers I have talked to, they have an increasing number of variants. So products get more variant rich. There are different editions of the same product. Software is delivered via the cloud uh, in which you can activate or deactivate feature, features for the software. Um, but the documentation partly needs to be generated still in an unstructured way with no reuse and no variant management in the authoring environment. Also, um, people want to switch from the conventional formats to uh, more advanced output formats like content delivery, web helps uh, and stuff like that, but they can't because they are still caught in the unstructured world. Um, strategically, uh, as a strategic consideration, we all need to move uh, f uh, towards intelligent content, or as we uh, call it, intelligent information, saying that we need to get prepared for delivering information that can be consumed in, in the form of chunked, chunks and which is semantically enriched uh, by metadata so that it can be retrieved on demand for example, in augmented reality applications, um, in uh, service applications or in content delivery portals. In uh, Germany or in, in, in the whole of Europe, you additionally have the problem that you have a high demand for localization because uh, manufacturers and software vendors usually need to translate their products and their documentation into 20 plus languages. So these are the challenges that we face and the question is, how do we start the process and get into structured authoring or even better uh, find a way to intelligent content? And the best way is to start with a requirement, not just buy a tool, but collect your requirements. And I would like to provide you with a list of um, areas that you need to check and see whether which requirements results result from, from these areas. And the first one is that you should take a look at the information products that you need, saying, so uh, an information product is something that you need to publish in some way, it can be an online help, it can be the delivery to a portal, it can be a PDF uh, that you need to supply or even a print product that you put into the box together with your product your physical product. So you need to consider how, uh, what, which kind of information I need to deliver, uh, which information types are required. Um, for example, do I need instructions for use or also for transport, disposal and maintenance? And which target groups are, will be using that kind of information? Then you need to consider how far 
or how well advanced your information architecture is. If you decide to switch to structured authoring, you need to think about, a modula, uh, about the modules that you want to create and which degree of modularization you want to achieve in your content. Because you need to split up your big documents into smaller chunks, usually uh, topics, but it could also be even smaller chunks like fragments or elements, whatever you, you call them. And you need to find uh, a way of analyzing your content in order to identify those modules, because they are the prerequisite for reusing content and for publishing modular documentation. There are different approaches uh, for creating modules with your content. Uh, you can do that bottom-up or top-down. Um, bottom-up means that you would uh, take a look at all your information products and compare them. Um, for example, the information products for different variants and then identify the content that is similar between those information products and create modules based on that analysis. Top-down means that you start with the structure of the information product, for example, the list of chapters and topics and subchapters. Um, and then create modules for the different entries in this table of contents. Once you have your modules, uh, you also have the analysis results for the variants that you can create from the same source. And in order to actually produce output for different variants, you need metadata that uh, reflect um, the variant information, saying metadata to differ between different product variants, metadata to mark content that is suitable for different qualification levels or skill levels, like experts or um, normal users, administrators, developers, or um, metadata um, that uh, marks uh, specific content types like troubleshooting, which may be relevant for finding service-related information for service technicians or troubleshooters in a call center. So that means uh, before you actually start selecting a system, the, the content architecture, the information architecture need to be at least sketched and you need a concept for that. Okay, the next area you should take a look at is the, the output that you want to generate. Not on generate not only the output that you currently need, but also the output that you want to provide in the future strategically, like um, content delivery portal that you want to set up, or applications that you want to use to provide information to your people, like service technicians or sales uh, personnel that wants to have the product information in the field when they talk to customers. Um, so that also is uh, based on a target group analysis uh, and their requirements regarding information consumption. Another aspect regarding uh, which output to generate and how to deliver content to the consumers is whether you have to serve specific interfaces, whether you have to deliver content to other applications, to um, maybe customers which then create their own documentation based on your documents. And for this, you can you will probably need exchange formats, either for a specific interface, um, or if, um, you can also use standard exchange formats like IRS, which is a exchange format for intelligent information, which is currently being developed in Europe. So there's also this aspect of exchanging documentation or delivering documentation as a supplier. So for, from all these aspects, you can derive uh, requirements for your structured authoring environment. The next aspect that you need to consider is whether you need to integrate your authoring environment with other systems. Um, nobody works alone. Um, and although we are currently bridging silos more and more in companies, there are still dedicated systems for dedicated purposes, uh, which also makes sense because um, the systems 
serve their specific purposes and are best suited when they are specialized. So there, there will never be one tool that fits all. Uh, so there are probably tools and systems in your company for requirements management, for product information, for source code, versioning, and, and stuff like that. And then you have publication systems like a document management system, a web portal, a website, or the marketing stuff that um, people provide information in. Okay, so the, info the information systems that you uh, interface with are on the one hand the incoming systems like a requirements management system or product information that comes from SAP or a product information management system. So you probably need to take a look whether the authoring env environment that you want to create um, has an interface for that. You need to specify this as a requirement. Then you have requirements deriving from um, system functions that you want to use within your authoring environment. This could be, for example, an authoring memory or linguistic checkers like Acrolinks or a translation memory that you need in order to translate your content to 20 plus European languages. And then you need to take a look at the systems that you deliver output to. Uh, saying an automatic build system if you want your documentation to be built together with the software that you document. Or if you want to deliver content to a web portal or a service application. So these are, these are the outgoing interfaces. And all these interfaces result in requirements for your authoring environment. Then there's the question of which kind of data access and data storage you need. There are client server based solutions, cloud based solutions, um, locally installed solutions, uh, or just a, um, a file folder in your network. Everything is possible. And the question is uh, how many authors you need to connect and which uh, rules you need to comply with regarding data protection, data security, and server architecture. So um, go and talk to your IT guys and uh, try to find out uh, what fits the architecture, the IT structure of your company. Okay, all these uh, areas result in requirements. And uh, most of them in, in functional requirements that you can write down as user stories. But you can supplement the requirements also when you analyze the, or by analyzing the general conditions for your project. And one aspect of the general conditions is which resources do you have available and which processes do you have in your company. So are we talking about one or two authors? Uh, are we talking about full-time authors that have a lot of skills in, in XML, for instance? And how many part-time authors do we have? Maybe you have a lot of engineers who actually write the documentation and only one technical writer who, who does all the terminology work and the reviews. Another question is where are all these authors located? Are we talking about Europe, Asia and US for instance, or do we have one team in one location um, where a local access would be fine, whereas for the other constellation you would need a server solution or a cloud-based solution. Then you need to define your requirements regarding your processes. So are we talking about authoring processes only or do you need a system that also covers reviews and publications? If you, um, many companies are already working with a kind of uh, workflow management um, so if you are, for instance, uh, working with JIRA or with other workflow management uh, tools and requirements management tools, then you probably don't need uh, these functions in your authoring environment because you would um, plug in into the existence, existing systems. 
The same applies to publication processes. If you are able to plug into the build uh, processes of the software department, you don't probably do not need a publication server in your authoring environment. So processes result in uh, functional requirements for your authoring solution. Another more soft factor is uh, the skills that you have available in your team or in your authoring teams. Um, how much do they know about authoring? Are they willing to deal with XML or would they rather prefer, prefer a uh, easy to use word-like interface for writing their content? So their uh, technical expertise and their technical communication expertise is very important. Another point is which resources do you have for development and maintenance of the solution? Are you willing to outsource everything that is related to customizing the system to an external partner or a vendor? Or do you want to have um, development uh, customization and spe specialization in-house? And if you don't have the skills in-house, are you willing to invest in, in training and build up the knowledge required for that part? Another aspect is, of course, time and cost. Um, if you consider investing into a CCMS or a data solution, there are actually three kinds of costs. First is the initial investment, there are license costs that you need to pay. Um, the second is most systems, um, require, most vendors require you to sign a support maintenance contract, which is usually 15 to 20% of the, of the license cost of the initial investment. And then uh, you have the implementation costs where somebody needs to develop the informa information architecture I talked about earlier. Uh, somebody needs to develop your specialized output formats with your logo and your CI and your layout. And somebody needs to uh, develop um, interfaces between the systems, those interfaces that you require to connect to ingoing or outgoing systems. And it gets more expensive if you are in a hurry, if you don't have too much time, um, or if you have the requirement of customization, then you have to consider that this takes time. There is no CCMS project that is that doesn't take at least a year to, to be implemented and uh, to be rolled out. Another aspect is uh, the technical infrastructure that you already have in your company. Uh, there are companies that uh, allow, for example, Linux um, systems or others, um, Microsoft partners and only or Adobe partners. So there may be restrictions from that side, but even if those um, systems do not fully yeah, provide the full coverage of your requirements, may even um, may move up the list and become the favorite system because they fit the infrastructure that you already have in your company. Um, the management needs to decide whether they want to make a solution or buy a solution and whether they want to get into a, get dependent on the vendor of a CCMS, for example. The scope of a project is one of the most important things from, from my experience as a project manager, because um, there's always the danger of scope creep, as we call it, so that more and more requirements um, move into your project. So if we do that, we could also do that. Oh yeah, that would be fine too. We could kill two birds with one stone. But that, that is dangerous because um, it makes your project longer. It makes your project more uh, expensive. And um, that's why you should um, focus on the realistic requirements, on, on the biggest pains and on things that you can achieve in a short time, so fast gains. Then you could also focus on what the team can do by itself and you uh, must be careful not to overload your team 
with a scope too large. And of course, there's the budget issue. If you consider buying a CCMS or investing into a data solution, uh, there's probably a budget that you need to adhere to. And um, trying to assess and estimate this budget is one of the most difficult parts in such a project. Okay, so the general conditions for a, say, let's say, content management project also result in, func in requirements, in functional requirements, but also in non-functional requirements. And what we usually do is when, when we do that phase of the project, the requirements analysis phase, is that we write down the, the most important requirements in, in the form of user stories. Say, um, as a technical author, I would like reviewers to be able to uh, review and comment uh, a text that, that I sent them, but uh, they shall not be able to edit the actual content because I as an author want to decide uh, which changes to take into the content, which changes to accept. So it's always the form as a role, I want this because. So this motivation is very important uh, because it gives you the actual reason why people want to have a feature. And this may result in decisions that another feature covers this requirement, although this is not what they actually wanted. This is very important. So if you have a list of requirements, they don't need to be uh, detailed into every aspect. They just need to uh, cover all the areas that I showed you and to give a general picture of uh, the functions that the solution shall provide. And you can take those user stories and prioritize them and assigning priorities to them like must have, could have, or should have, or I won't have um, this feature. And then you can go into the selection process for the authoring solution or for the CCMS. And if you do that, you are spoiled for choice. There's so many solutions on the market um, if you visit the TC World Conference in, in Stuttgart, you have several hundred booths or uh, if two uh, halls full with booths of uh, with CCMS vendors and uh, small solution vendors and everything that you want and don't need, you can find there. And it's difficult to decide which system is best, especially if you have not defined your requirements well in advance. So basically, uh, there are two categories of solutions, uh, uh, tools for unstructured authoring and tools for structured authoring. And I apologize for the, for the there's much text on the next slides, but this is due to the fact that we want, would like to deliver you the slides as well. And uh, you don't have to read it, just listen. Of course, you know the unstructured solutions. And uh, I put in markdown languages here as well. Um, and wikis are also unstructured and um, for some of, of uh, our customers unstructured solution is nice because um, their main focus lies on getting quick results or their main focus lies on getting um, subject matter experts to deliver to provide content and to provide information and for for those people it may be uh, good not to invest into a structured authoring solution but um, to, to get like a Markdown or a Markdown environment or a wiki to deliver information fast to, to their customers. If you decide for an unstructured authoring solution, you need to be aware that uh, you probably can't handle variants with that and that, you, that your possibilities for content modules and content reuse are limited. Then there are structured authoring solutions, of course. Um, and this is actually where the question starts, whether you should go for a data-only solution with no CCMS or whether you go for a CCMS with data or whether you go for a CCMS without data. Um, all the systems that are available on the market separate between content and layout. Most of them already uh, separate between content, layout, and metadata as well. 
um, and you can use content modules in, in the structured authoring solutions, reuse content and publish variants from the same source. Um, the tools differ in the costs that you need to pay and the price that you need to pay. They differ regarding their um, extensibility or a specialization potential in their publication um, publication targets and ways of pu publishing content and uh, they differ um, regarding the interfaces that they provide to other systems. So that is why you need your list of requirements because uh, only then you can actually evaluate whether a system is good for you or not. So there is not actually a perfect system. You just need to find a system that covers your solution, uh, your requirements now, your current requirements, and your requirements, your strategic requirements for the future. Okay, a component, deciding for a component management system is usually best if you are looking for a tool that covers also uh, workflow functions, review functions, translation management, so or metadata management. So if you need these kind of functions plus a client server architecture or a cloud solution, then a component content management system is a good choice, especially as there are a lot of uh, CCMSs in the market that also support data or have data as their uh, content format. If you go for a CCMS, uh, you also go into a vendor login, although there's a difference between systems supporting DITA and systems working within own with a special document type definition. If you uh, go for a DITA CCMS, your vendor login is less strict because you can could move out your content uh, because it's stored in, in DITA in the DITA format and go to another system. That is also nice when you go for when you want to have a delivery content delivery portal that is not provided by the same vendor by the same manufacturer. So, what we see increasingly now also with with IRDS where you have a, a standardized exchange format is that people start choosing a CCMS from one vendor and a content delivery portal from another vendor because they have a defined way of transporting content from one system to the other. A data-only solution without a CCMS is, is a good possibility uh, when you want to, uh, of course, if you want to use a standard and if you um, want to use a data open toolkit for generating the output uh, formats. Uh, data makes you, as I said, tool independent and there's a, a big community where you can get advice, uh, where you can hire experts and where you can find information on how to, to do stuff with uh, data. That also means that uh, you need a sp uh, special expertise if you work with data only without a CCMS that gives you all the usability and convenience functions. Um, that means you need to either hire an expert or uh, you build up, you need to build up the knowledge yourself. And even if data is uh, free of charge and open source, you still have to invest some money in order to set up your information architecture in order to buy a convenient editor for data and in order to customize the output format um, saying that you, you need a customized uh, web help or um, a content delivery format that looks like your company's uh, um, CI. Okay, I, um, Alan, we didn't discuss this before, but I actually wanted to present some scenarios and if people want to um, participate, they, they can, because I what, what I did is that I pre prepared uh, three scenarios, typical customer scenarios that we um, encountered in our work. And uh, I would like to ask the people whether they have an idea how these uh, guys could solve their what would be the best solution for the, the scenarios, uh, a data um, solution or a component content management system or something else. 
Sure, we can have people type in their responses in the questions panel, and I will do my best to collate those and share that information with you. Yeah, let's just try it. If not, I will play the audience, <laughs> the participant. <laughs> okay, uh, first scenario. Uh, we are talking about a company that does uh, first-class hair dryers. This is probably called a curler or something in, in American English. Not quite sure. Curling iron, perhaps? Curling iron, yeah. So um, this is what they do. They don't have any single sourcing so far. So um, their problem is that their content and layout tends to become inconsistent. And they do have a problem because people have to copy the technical data uh, from the product data management system. And whenever changes in the product data management system, those changes are not automatically transferred to the product brochures and the data sheets. It's a small company only. They have 20, uh, 75 employees and only two authors, and only one of them is a skilled technical writers, writer. Um, they want to generate PDF um, because they, uh, and, and print um, because they need to put the product information uh, in the box with the hairdryer. But they do have video tutorials on their website. Um, their information products are like brochures, data sheets, uh, warranty information, which is translated into 10 languages. And they do have some variants for their hairdryers. Um, which differ in, in little aspects, say like 10 to 20% of the features are different, but 80 to 90% of the features are similar. The, the authoring team has little technical expertise. They know how to deal with layout and uh, they know how to make videos, and but they're not very uh, yeah, good with um, software and IT systems in general. So what do you think, uh, what would be a good solution for them? A CCMS or a, a small authoring solution or a, a data only solution? Yeah, please go ahead and type in your answer into the questions module if you would. I'll give people a little bit longer. Okay, this is interesting, Ulrika. We are getting answers kind of all over the board here. I am seeing, let's see, out of about six responses so far, four are saying a CCMS, but I am seeing two saying a more simple solution such as um, a FrameMaker, for example. Interesting, yeah, thanks for your response. Um, that's actually what I think as well. The most simplest solution would be better uh, suited in this case, a, a FrameMaker or even an InDesign solution that has an interface to the product data um, management system. Um, because there we are not talking about intelligent information here. Um, or a small uh, CCMS would be also good, but nothing, um, they actually don't need a client server solution or a, a cloud system not uh, resulting from their requirements. So yeah, I agree with the two people, <laughs> actually. So let's go for the next. Okay. So here we have a startup company, a software startup that does applications for public transport. Um, a very European thing, I know, but uh, this is, uh, so this is an app that lets you find public transport uh, stops uh, uh, nearby and tells you when the next bus or uh, subway leaves and where you can get from, from your current location. So they, they are a startup with uh, 30 employees only. They don't have any technical writer and they don't have any documentations, but they've got their first client. Uh, and uh, their first customer re, uh, demands documentation as well, because uh, usually in Europe, the, the public transports in the end uh, is in public hands. So it's a um, public co company. It belongs to the state or the, the, the district. Um, 
right now they uh, they want to deliver mobile help with their app um, with small tutorials for developers and a user manual for the users they d are restricted to German right now but of course they want to uh, conquer the European market and uh, publish everything in several languages. As they are software engineers, they have an expertise and, and tools for version control, task tracking, uh, ticketing. Uh, they know XML because their configuration is done in XML and they have an automatic build. So what are your votes, what they should do to organize their documentation? We even had one answer before you finished talking. So people are, <laughs> people are, People are paying attention. This is also interesting. We've got about maybe a dozen answers so far. Okay, let's see. Um, I am seeing, for example, data without a CMS, perhaps lightweight data and some kind of version control system like Git. Um, some people are saying a small solution. There's another markup in Git. Um, some people are saying DITA, just the DITA open toolkit. Um, DITA without a CCMS, DITA only. Small non-CCMS solution, Git plus an editor. And then someone actually called out the Oxygen XML editor. So there's a little more agreement on those answers. Yep. I, I do agree. Uh, I, I would say that as a customer for DITA, uh, Oxygen plus DITA Open Toolkit, or even Markdown. Um, yeah, I, I agree. So let's move on to the next. Thank you for your answers. The next one is from the machinery industry. They do washing machine components. Um, and um, they, their current documentation process is uh, very manually. They have to do the DTP themselves um, and they have a decentralized team because they're an international company uh, which is subsidiaries in different countries. And what they want to achieve with, this, uh, with the solution is that they want to centralize the documentation because they um, now, right now, they work with a spread team and the people will still be spread, but uh, they want to work in one system. Um, right now they work with FrameMaker, but um, they could think of another editor. They are open for that. Uh, right now the administer administration is via a file storage on a server, but not all people have access. So that is getting diff difficult there. They need PDF and HTML. In the end, they also need intelligent information because they want to create um, a content delivery portal where and they want to deliver um, their information in a format that uh, the machine washing machine manufacturers can integrate their documentation more easily than now. Um, they have of course 20 plus languages uh, and they do have money because they are bestseller and uh, they are willing to invest money. So what would be the best solution? And the answers once again came in before you stopped talking. <laughs> it's a clear case, actually, yes. Yeah. Okay, universally, I am seeing over and over again, DITA plus CCMS, DITA plus CCMS, DITA plus CCMS. That is mm -hmm. almost universal at this point. Yeah, I agree. Uh, in Germany, the answer would not necessarily be DITA, but it would be CCMS. Um, there are a lot of CCMS on, on the German market that do not support data and which would cover this use case. And um, the acceptance in the, in the German market is uh, so like 9% of all the people who use structured authoring, XML authoring use data and um, the rest use another DTD or schema. So that why, that's why it's probably not a data CMS if you follow these statistics. But of course, I would vote for a data CMS. Okay, that was actually my, my presentation. Uh, okay. That's good, 45 minutes. Yeah, we do have a few questions and let me share those worth with you. The first one is, um, do you need to have um, a custom structure set up before you start looking at CCMSs? 
You mean a custom um, DTD or, or exactly. a document type definition? Exactly. No, not necessarily. Um, no, because um, you probably have the general requirement that you need structured authoring and you probably have an idea of which information types you need, like um, tasks, um, reference, uh, troubleshooting and e-learning. And uh, on that level, you need a structure definition, but you don't need to go into the XML details and defining all the elements or all the attributes that you need. You can stay on that more abstract level and then uh, go and talk to the vendors and, and see whether they provide these types of content. Out of curiosity, what schemas are used in the German market other than DITA? Uh, these are custom schemes. Um, I know uh, one or two CCMSs who work with DocBook. I know uh, in, in big uh, systems like uh, Schema ST4 or uh, DocuFi, they, work, they just have their own DTDs, which are heavily influenced by the machinery uh, industry and which cover the requirements of machinery of the machinery industry very well, much better than did in, in, in most cases, probably, um, because otherwise they would ha wouldn't ha have reached such a high acceptance. That's my personal view, um, which doesn't need to be true. <laughs> uh, we also just dropped in a link to the session evaluation survey. So please look in the questions panel and you'll see that there attendees and we appreciate your input on that. Some other questions. Um, within a CCMS, is it possible to support multiple DTDs? No, that's, diffi that's difficult. What you can do is establish import routes for other um, content that, that follows another DTD. So I know CCMS uh, which um, support data import, for example. But this will always be an import export, not um, but because in the end, in the system, you need to stick to one document type definition. I had a comment about FrameMaker being categorized as unstructured authoring, but that may have been before you showed your slide with it being structured, but I did want to call that out and mention that to you. Yeah, FrameMaker unstructured for me is unstructured authoring. FrameMaker yes. structured is structured authoring. Yeah, it's basically tool tools in one. At one time, many mm -hmm. years ago, and I won't say how long ago, it was two separate tools, but they have folded both of those into one product now. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, then uh, I apologize. I will update you're, that. You're not wrong. No, you're not wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's still, you have to toggle it, unstructured or structured. So it can be uh. either. It can be more desktop publishing, or it can be structured on a custom DTD or the DITA DTD. So you're right. Mm -hmm. okay. You're absolutely right. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, can you give me an overview of what the DITA Open Toolkit does? Uh, the DITA Open Toolkit kit is a set of uh, scripts that for different purposes. The main purpose is to generate output formats like PDF, uh, HTML5, uh, Web Help, HTML Help, or yeah, simple HTML, um, and uh, they are open source and freely available. So what you get when you run your data content through the data open toolkit is a basic output. Um, what you need to do when you work with the data open toolkit is that you need to adapt the scripts to your corporate layout. And maybe also if you specialize data to your specialized data elements. So in order to have a nicely layouted output in some way, and in order to be able to, to handle the XML elements that you may have added to the data to your document type definition. So if you work with the data open toolkit, it's great because you have a good basis to start from but you need somebody who is able to, to uh, handle those scripts. So you need a, like a programmer or a, a technical communicator with programming skills. And especially the uh, PDF output via XSLFO is a very special knowledge. Um, that in my experience, Alan, I don't know what you think not many people have. 
It is a very, very specialized um, skill set, and it can be very hard to find people to fill that type of work. Yeah. Luckily, uh, there there's this new development towards uh, PDF generation via CSS. Yes. Uh, so th th this, uh, if that actually fully hits the market, that will be easier to find people who are capable of doing that. And I think you were being very kind about being a good starting point. That is what it is, but be prepared for the default output to be, frankly, very ugly because it is not ready to be shipped out to customers, at least not in my opinion. No, it's good for review copies, but <laughs> nothing more. That's about it. You're right. Any advice for limiting and stopping uh, increasing scope during a project? Yeah, if you have, if you define your requirements as user stories, um, then uh, you need to be very strict on not adding user stories to your uh, to your backlog. Um, so that that is one way, and you need a project manager. Uh, with a certain amount of experience um, who discovers that and who is uh, good at communication and telling people, okay, yeah, that is a valid requirement that you have and would be nice to have that, but let's add that to uh, a second set of requirements that I um, manage for, uh, for the next project phase, for example. So splitting up your project into several phases and for the first pay phase limit the scope very strictly is a good approach because then you make sure that the people can bring in their requirements and are happy because this is what they want. They want their work to be become more easy, easier uh, and you don't lose their requirements but you prevent a, a scope creep. So for each new requirement that you get you need to uh, defined as is that still within our my original project scope or do I need to add that to my second Excel list with user stories? The person who asked about the data, I mean the data open toolkit says thank you and wanted to and understands now that it's more of uh, a way to get output and not necessarily something that an author would deal with and that is correct. It is more of a way uh, to get the output and your CCMS may point to the open toolkit to output you know your delivery formats but you as an author probably would not be touching the data toolkit yourself to change the formatting and things like that. Yeah true. Oh, following up on that, what was not ready to ship to customers? Uh, we were talking about the output, the default output from the DITA Open Toolkit. It is very basic. It will have none of your corporate branding. So it is a very good foundation for starting, but it will need modification to, first of all, look attractive and follow better, more modern design rules. And it will need some changes to reflect your corporate logos, colors, etc. Any other questions? Well, Erika, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, and thank you for the to the audience for the participation.